Hi students, in this lecture I'm going to go over part one of Allen Ginsberg's Howl. So let's go ahead and look at the poem. Okay, so um, as you're looking at it, you're going to notice um, that it's just one long sentence that just keeps going and going and going. There's no periods. Um, it's very different from the you know original poems you read, the sonnets we read, um, and it's very different from even the wasteland. Um, it's not separated in quite concise ways and it's not as distinctly in iambic pentameter, although if you listen to Ginsberg's speed, you're going to hear the rhythms that are in it. It's really considered stream of consciousness, kind of just coming from the mind, and it really would be kind of confessional in a sense, but it's also telling a story, and it is an epic. Um, but I'm just going to go over uh, part one for now. Um, as you're looking through this, um, I just suggest that you go line by line and kind of just summarize each thing. I've, I've kind of done this. I haven't done the whole thing, but I'm going to go over most of it with you. Um, and really the thing you're going to notice is it's chaotic. There's a lot of different things being described in all different ways, and it's really chaotic, and it's almost post-apocalyptic, very much like the wasteland. Um, so let's start with just the first line. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. So just from the start, you've got this reference to, um, and it's interesting, the best minds are destroyed. So something about like, you know, the the people that he thinks are the most valuable are the ones that are the most affected, right? Um, and they're destroyed by trauma from the, from the war or just society in general, um, destroyed by drugs, destroyed by addictions. Um, and then this idea of, you know, these angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. And so, again, just like the wasteland, right, they're looking for spirituality, they're looking for a connection. And again, we're thinking about how this is all existentialist, like, they are post-World War II, they're, they're thinking, what, what is the point? What is the meaning of life? What is my purpose? Is there a God, right? How could a God let something like the Holocaust happen? These were real questions that came about. Um, and so really like people are trying to find a connection with nature and spirituality, but they can't um, because there's a dichotomy going on between nature versus machinery, nature versus industry, right? We've got, we are in beyond the industrial revolution at this point, right? It's the rise of capitalism. And then there's also, you know, um, discussion of poverty, uh, who poverty and tatters and hollowed eyes and high sat up and smoking in the supernatural darkness of the cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. So you've got an, like a, a mention of poverty, right? This is supposed to be the time of, you know, industrialization and capitalism and consumerism in America. It's the greatest time in our economy. And yet there's people dealing with poverty. Um, also, this is an urban environment setting as opposed to the wasteland, which was mostly rural, right? It was the countryside. Um, so we've got a completely different uh, setting. Also, it's in the American cities. Um, and this is also kind of a nod to the Harlem Renaissance, the Black Renaissance, right? Contemplating jazz. Because I said, I said in the other lecture, at the same time that, um, you know, this counterculture movement's going on, you've got the rise of the Black Panther Party and the Civil Rights Movement is like still, you know, going um, and sometimes working together. Um, and then there's also this kind of mention of, you know, this reaching for the Far East, the Eastern philosophies, which were discussed in the Wasteland as well. Um, and then, you know, an ode to these young college students who are really fighting for revolution and rebellion against conservatism, right, against consumerism. Um, and they're just expelled, um, who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes to the windows of the skull, right, they're rejected for their ideas. Um, and very much so during this time in academia, you were not allowed to talk about things that were counterculture, that were against where American progress was going. Um, that were anti-capitalistic, and then, you know, there's also an ode to burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the tear through the wall. So again, this anti-capitalistic movement. Um, and then also moving deeper and deeper into addictions, right? Who eat fire and paint hotels or drink turpentine in Paradise Alley, death or purgatory their torsos night after night, again, steeping deeper and deeper into addiction. Um, and then there's also a reference to the free love movement, sex positivity movement. Remember, Allen Ginsberg is a Jewish gay man living in New York. And so there's a whole celebration of the queer identity here, which again was rejected in this time. You know, this was a time of suburban, vanilla, kind of like man and woman and child and, you know, white picket fence kind of a time period, um, which these people are really like not in the mood for that, <laughs> right? They wanted more from life. Um, and then there's also like this uh, kind of ode to uh, institutionalization from war trauma, um, the shocks of hospitals and jails and wars. Um, you know, again, like if you were part of the counterculture, if you were in, in trauma from war, if you were, 
you know, a queer person, if you were someone that didn't go along with the status quo, you were thought of as mentally ill and they locked you up in an institution. Um, so yeah, it's really, um, there's also references to drug use, heroin specifically. Um, uh, the vagabond life, like people would, would kind of just move across America. Um, this was like a thing back um, do, uh, in post-World War II. Um, you can read about it in On the Road by Jack Kerouac. People really were wandering across the United States on a spiritual quest, looking for answers, looking for something, right? Um, there's also an ode to the Black Panthers who reappeared on the West Coast investigating the FBI and Beards um, with shorts and big pacifist eyes, sexy in their dark skin, passing out incomprehensible leaflets. Um, there's also kind of a mention to the super communistic ideas, right? Anyone that was anti-capitalism was labeled a communist, was labeled an enemy of the United States. Um, and so this was a big deal, especially in the universities. Um, and then again, like uh, references to free love and queer queer identity, um, uh, mentions of the unemployment, the other side of progress, right? Um, uh, woke on a sudden Manhattan and picked themselves up out of basements, hung over with heartless Tokai and horrors of Third Avenue iron dreams and stumbled into unemployment offices. So it's like the other side of progress, right? Um, sorry, I'm kind of flipping through this, but I don't have time for all of it. And there's also a mention of, you know, Wall Street and capitalism. Um, I love this line here, who fell on their knees in hopeless cathedrals, praying for each other's salvation, right? Hopeless cathedrals, like empty cisterns, kind of like in the, the wasteland. No one's listening. God is gone, right? Like they're just alone. Um, it really is po almost post-apocalyptic. And then there's mention of Dadaism, which if you don't know what that is, um, essentially it was an art movement that came out that was really kind of against modernity, like, and the absurdity of it, right? Like, so it really was these, like, everyday objects, like a urinal or, like, you know, an iron, <laughs> and just showing it off as art. It's it's ironic, right? It's, it's, in a sense, very ironic. It's, like, not art. It's everyday objects. There's nothing about it that's beautiful. Um, and yet people are seeking beauty in the everyday, right? The, the mundane. Um, and so if you want to check out more about Dadaism, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, but at the, you know, the end of the poem, with absolute heart of the poem of life butchered out of their own bodies, good to eat a thousand years. Really just everything, the beauty of life, um, the poetry, the, the pleasure of life is just desecrated and consumed. Um, so really this ends on a note of just kind of, um, you know, bleakness and, and really like emptiness, um, very much like the wasteland. I'm going to do another video for the other parts, but hopefully that gives you, um, yeah, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into part one.